not understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. I'm singing by and by. Oh, when the morning come, you know all the saints of God are gathering home. And we will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. We are often destitute of the things that life demands. Want of shelter and of food, thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word. We will understand it better by and by. I'm singing by and by. Oh, when the morning come, you know all the saints of God are gathering home. And we will tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Good morning, everyone. Good to see so many of you here this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday. Wow. I mean, it, when I looked out the window this morning, I said, look at this beauty. It was re it's really beautiful outside. It's a real beautiful fall day. Uh, we're going to study from the book of Joshua, chapter 6. What's the book of Joshua, chapter 6? That's the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Here, uh, Jer Jericho refused to let Israel become its, its master uh, or, conquer, or conquer them. So they shut themselves up in the city and nobody went out as a deserter or to offer a, a, a treaty of peace, nor were any admitted in to offer peace. These people thought that they were secure within these walls. And nothing could get in, and nobody couldn't get out, and they had plenty of provisions to stay locked up that way. And we have to be very careful about the walls that we build in this life. Because people build walls where they won't even let the Lord in. They build walls to keep God out of certain areas where they don't want God to be in their lives. And, you know, when you build these walls up, you can um, do yourself a real disservice. Because, you know, if you put a $10 bill in my hand and I clench my fist, you will not be able to get that $10 out. <laughs> you will not be able to get that out. At the same time, if you had a $100 bill to replace that 10 with, you couldn't get it in either. And so we can't go through life building walls up in our lives where we say, Lord, you're not, you're not welcome in this area, but you're okay to come over here. 
We can't build walls up like that. Another wall that we like to build up, like these people, they shut themselves in. You know, during this pandemic, people shut themselves in. You know, they order the groceries online and the groceries get delivered to the door. They leave the bag in front of the door and walk away and then the people will open it. They don't even want to take it from the people. And so they're so, so shut in that they start to lose their sanity. I, I have a coworker that each Zoom meeting, I see some of her sanity slipping away. But this is my choice. This is my choice. Um, I said, don't you have some friends? She said, yes. She said, they're uptown. Well, how, how about you ride the train up there and meet them at Central Park or something? And y'all be socially distanced and you have a conversation. And you get to interact with your friends. But some people, uh, they, they build these walls up. It's self-inflicted. It's not necessary, but it's self-inflicted. Now, uh, during this pandemic time, there's some walls you got to build to protect yourself. You got to build some of these walls, you know. You can't have a whole lot of people in your house. And if they can't understand why they can't be there, then sad on them. Because I'm trying to stay here another day. I'm not going to leave here because I, I wanted 13 people in my home. I remember there was a gathering with 13 family members. And they all came together for something. And then when the function was over, four of them caught COVID and died. Was it really worth that? Discipline. Discipline. This story about the walls of Jericho teach us a whole lot of things about ourselves and about people's behavior. Look, um, during this pandemic, this pandemic time, we got to be careful that we don't act like Jericho and close up our minds so they get clo close up themselves like they close themselves up in the city. When you close your mind, Nothing gets out, but nothing can get in. So this morning, I'm, I'm hoping that you will not shut down during this pandemic. Why do we build walls? Why do we build walls? Walls in a home provide a barrier to keep out the elements, to ensure privacy, and to hang pictures. Now, why do we build walls, though? We build walls because of fear, for protection, as a defense against hostile forces. We build walls all the time in our lives. We build walls to keep people from uh, knowing our innermost thoughts. Walls can be good, walls can be bad. We build walls where we, 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 where we won't let our own spouse penetrate for fear that we can't trust them with this, that information. Spouses build walls with one another. Now, if your husband or your wife is supposed to be your best friend, supposed to be your best friend, there's nothing in this world you really can't tell them, and vice versa. But even in our relationship, we build walls. There's still stuff we don't want people to know. But who knows? Regardless, who knows? God knows. You can hide it from all of us, but God knows. And we build up walls because we don't want, some people build up walls, they don't want nobody to get too close to them. They don't want nobody to get too close to them. It's a shame that uh, people let pride get in the way when they're in need, but they won't, they won't reach out to people and say, I need help. I need some food. I need a ride somewhere. You know, people build up walls with one another where they won't even let your brother or your sister help you because your pride. Listen, they told me that the closed mouth don't get fed. And if I need help, I'm going to yell, I need help. Because pride ain't going to put nothing in my stomach. But if I say help to somebody, somebody will feed me. I'm pretty sure one of these sisters in here would feed me. We build walls with one another. And you know, it's just a funny, it's just a funny observation I made between 
living in Georgia and being back here in Jersey. When we finish, when we finish worship in Georgia, a whole, we would pick a restaurant and a whole lot of us would go there and eat. And people would let their guard down and let's talk. They would let their guards down and let's talk. When I got back here to Jersey, after worship, people here don't want to sit down and talk. Very small numbers, if any, will go sit down and break bread together and let people get to know. Everybody here runs to their humble abode. See you next week. That's it. And so I just noticed that it's such a difference that we put walls up with our brothers and sisters. We don't even want our brothers and sisters to know us. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Because fellowship is part of Christianity. You can't be a Christian on an island by yourself. Fellowship is part of Christianity. You don't want to come to any of the functions the church has because you don't want to mingle with people. How you don't want to mingle with your brothers and sisters? Listen, I got a news flash. If you won't mingle with them here, do you think you're going to mingle with them up there? If you won't greet your brothers and sisters down here with a holy kiss, what you going to do up there? You're not going to greet none of the saints up there? Because all the saints up there, all they do is sing and praise God all day long. So if you can't sing and praise God down here, what you going to do when you get to heaven? You can't be tight-lipped up there. I don't want to sing the song. This ain't my favorite song. All the songs up there is good. What you going to do if you won't sing down here? That's all they do up there, sing and praise God all day long. Yes, it's cool. <laughs> Sister Coleman said sometimes people sit around and mingle and talk and then the next week what they talked about is on Facebook. Yeah. Well, she got a very valid point there. She got a valid point there. Um, that's why we all got to use our common sense and be careful what information we disperse. We have to be careful about that because some people can't handle certain information. And that's why we build these walls. For some people, the wall is this high. For others, it's only fence high. Because I can't trust that person with this kind of information, but I can trust this person. Me and Roy, we can trust each other with a lot of information that I probably can't trust other people with. Because that very reason what you said. You want to know what we talked about last night? It's on Facebook. It'll be on Facebook this morning. So my practice is I don't say anything that I don't want repeated. Then you don't have to worry about getting into trouble. Don't say nothing that you don't want repeated. Then you don't have to worry about getting into trouble. Um, yes? Do what? Okay, thank you. All of us all of us have invisible walls that are difficult to deconstruct. If we are honest about who we are, we have to admit that we do not allow others to see our true selves. For some people, we build higher walls, such as belligerent family members, and, uh, uh, while for others, we keep it waist, a waist-high fence because we're afraid people will see too much of us and have nothing to do with us. Or we're afraid we will lose something if we allow others to influence us or change us. So we throw up a wall. And we have many walls. We have many walls. We throw up a wall. And you know, when you keep doing something consistently, it'll become difficult to tear it down. It's going to become so commonplace that you don't think about it anymore. Just for instance, miss two or three Sundays in a row. It'll be easy for you to miss that fourth and that fifth and that sixth. Because you'll be done 
build up this wall that it doesn't matter. And then, then it's hard for you to deconstruct it. Because now when you want to go back, you think, oh, what's everybody going to say? I've been away for eight weeks. What's everybody going to say? Oh, I'm going to get them looks. Now you're scared to come back because you've been out there too long. Never construct a wall between you and the Word of God. Because in the end, the Bible says we're all going to be judged by the words in that book called the Bible. And so I never want to build a wall between me and God that I can't get his word. That's what I'm going to be judged by. So I need to know it. I need to know it for myself to know if I'm living right or living according to this book. Because that's what I'm going to be judged by later. Don't build a wall between you and God. People build a wall between them and God when they lose a family member that was dear to them. They wonder, why did God let this happen? And so they begin to build a wall of distrust between them and God. Nobody promised to stay here forever. We all, we all, listen, the minute the doctor smacked you on your backside and you began to yell, your clock started ticking as to how much time you got here. Your clock started ticking in. To lose a loved one, yeah, it's disheartening. It's rough. But it's a part of life. And we shouldn't build up a wall between ourselves and God because we lose a loved one. We build walls in our relationships where we cannot allow anyone to penetrate because they might find out who I really am. Once you get into the habit of building walls, then lastly, you build that wall where you won't let God penetrate. And when you build a wall so that God's word doesn't penetrate or affect you anymore, you're going down the wrong path. In other words, you have built a wall that when you hear the word of God, it is of no effect upon you. And there's people like that. We see them all the time. They hear the word of God, but they're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. So the word of God is not having any effect on them. When you, when you go to work and you get reprimanded by your supervisor for something that you did incorrectly, you make sure you do it correctly from that point on, don't you? You make sure. You make sure. Then why not be that way with God? When the word of God is preached, when you study it, you ought to be obedient to it. When you fight in the word of God, you build a wall, but you're not letting the word of God change you. It's a sad commentary for a Christian to be in the church for 10 years or more and their behavior is still like when they first got baptized. Is the word of God having any effect on you? When I, when I first got baptized, I had a lot of stuff I had to clear up and clear out. A lot of stuff. But as the word of God was preached and it had its effects on me, I started clearing things out. Pulling stuff out the closet and throwing it out pulling stuff from under the bed and throwing it out. Clean up your speech, Michael. Stop talking like that. Get rid of that. I talk nothing now like I did then. Nothing like it. And so you got to not put that wall up and you got to let God's word have its effect on you. Because contrary to popular opinion, you cannot go to heaven the way you are now. There's some changes that we have to make. Listen, football teams and basketball teams and baseball teams, they practice actually before they play the game. Do they not? Okay. This is your practice field right here. This is your practice field before you get in the game. This is your practice field. And so... We want to practice as good as we can here so we can be admitted into the game. You know, like I, I coach AAU basketball. 
And if a kid is not ready, I won't put him in the game. He, I won't put him in the game. Now, if I move this in a different direction, if I haven't been practicing obedience here, how is he going to let me in there? This is your practice field here. You only get one go round. There's no do-over. There's no do-over. So when we hear the Word of God, when we read and study the Word of God, it ought to have an effect on us. Now, I, as I'm older, I understand why when the Word was preached, women would sometimes cry. Because I sat and, sitting right there and heard the Word of God and where I was at in my life at that time and started boohooing. Because the Word was cutting me right where I was at. And I didn't even know if Brother Lawton had a, had a dictaphone in my, in my house or what. But what I was dealing with, whatever the message was, the Word of God was there for me. I understand why people cry now when they hear the Word of God. I understand now. Because when that Word pricks your heart, you'll be like, how did the minister know that I was going through this? Because the Word of God is, is, is made that way to strengthen you wherever you're struggling. And that's why when he can preach a message, and there's something in there that's going to hit you. There's something in there that make the hands stand up on the back of your neck. Something in there to make your, hand, your hands tremble a little bit. Something to bring a tear to your eye, because that's how the Word of God is. It's able to reach each and every one of us, wherever we are in life right now. It's able to reach us. But we can't build up that wall to prevent it. These walls can be good also. And I'm glad we have walls to keep the criminals and the prisoners inside. I'm glad we got them walls. I'm glad there are walls and barriers to keep people from crossing the median when I'm driving on the highway so they don't come across and hit me head on. Jesus came to destroy walls, and his mission was to remove the barriers that keep us from knowing God and knowing each other. You remember when Christ tore down that veil between the Jew and the Gentile. That veil kept them from knowing each other. Because the Jews thought the Gentiles were dogs. That's how they looked at them, they dogs. But Christ tore down that veil so they could know each other. So they could know each other. He tore down that veil so we could know God. So we could know God. That's the walls that he tore down. In verse 2, look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 2. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand. We see here that when, when the Lord guides you and leads the way, the victory is already won before you even done anything. Why? Because the Lord said. Because the Lord said. You see that in verse 2 right there? And the Lord said. When God said, let there be light, it was light. And the Lord said. Now, God's telling us of the victory before it even happens. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 24. Here the Bible says, And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou hast destroyed them. God, God has already given us a victory before it even happens. Already given you a victory before it even happens. You praying for a victory, that's what you ought to pray for because we serve a victorious God. We do not serve a defeated Christ, but a victorious Christ. And so God, back in, jo in Joshua chapter six, verse two, 
He says, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho. Now, Joshua had been, you know, other successful victories in chapter 2. But this is because he trusted God to see him through. So in verse 2, he says, I have given. The Lord said, I have given. He didn't say, I will do it, but I have done it. I have done it. It's all thine own, as though it was already done, already in your possession. And we need to have a faith that praise like victory is already in your possession. It's a sad commentary to see a defeated Christian or one who thinks he is defeated by the enemy. A defeated Christian. I haven't seen any of them, but it's a shame. I'm sure that some exist. A defeated Christian. Wow, you serve a victorious God. How you speak defeat when Christ speaks victory. We sing that song, Victory in Jesus. So when we, when we pray, we ought to pray with the expectation of victory, not of defeat, not of this problem is pretty big. I'm not sure if God can really, really fix this one. We should never think that. Christians should never have a defeated attitude. Christians should always be optimistic. The world says, oh, I just had it. The world says, all good things must come to an end. Y'all ever heard that saying before? That's what the world says. All good things must come to an end. But for the Christian, you should be saying all bad things must come to an end. Remember the ecclesiastical writer says, everything has a season. That opening statement is so beautiful. You know why that's so beautiful? Because that tells me whatever I'm going through in my life won't be this way always. Seasons change from winter to spring to summer to fall. They change. And so whatever I'm going through, my assurance is that it's going to change. It's not going to stay like this. It's not going to stay like this. That's an assurance. That's an assurance. A Christian should never think about being defeated. Um, somebody had a question? Oh. Um, look at verse 3. Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. And you shall encompass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. This shalt thou do six days. So the captain of the Lord's host gives direction on how the city should be sieged. No, no trenches are to be built. No, no um, batteries erected. No battering rams are drawn up. No any military, uh, no military um, preparations are made. But the ark of God must be carried by the priest round the city once a day for six days together. And seven times the seventh day, attended by the men of war in silence. The priest all the while blowing the trumpets of, of ram's horn. This is all they were to do. Now, when God gives you directions, you just need to follow those directions. You don't need to add to the direction nor subtract from. Suppose Noah would have said, well, you know, this gopher was okay, but I'm going to throw some oak up in here. That boat would have sank. The oak wood is hard and heavy. It would have sank. You got to follow God's direction the way he gives it. And here's, here's a newsflash. Listen, when God, the Bible says it's not within man to order his own footsteps. Therefore, somebody else got to order them. Now, you got one or two people that you're going to let order your footsteps. Either you're going to let the enemy order your footsteps or you're going to let God order your footsteps. There ain't no in-between. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. Either you're going to let God order your footsteps or you're going to let the enemy order your footsteps. But the main thing is you don't try to order your footsteps because the Bible says it's not within man to order his own footsteps. So that means 
I'm only going to live for one person or the other. And if I'm not going to live for God, then that means I'm going to live for the enemy. That's what it means. If I don't live for God, I'm going to live for the enemy. These people, this is all they were supposed to do, is round that building as many times as the Lord said. Now, you know what we would have done? Uh, they had to do this for six days. We'd have stopped probably after the second. You know, we'd have said, I don't see no point in doing this. We ain't getting nowhere. We just, it's like running on a treadmill. You do three, four miles on the treadmill, but you ain't went nowhere. You're still, in the, you're still in the living room. You're still on that treadmill. You ain't went nowhere, but you did six or four miles. Yeah, we'd have been like, I'm not sure if the Lord, he got this one right. Man, I don't feel like walking around this thing again. Uh, today, again, I'm not. You know, we, we'd have had all kinds of excuses for not being obedient to God's direction. And that's how we get into trouble today, not being obedient. Disobedience is one of the worst things that affects Christians today. Disobedience. Disobedience sometimes is a lack of trust, and that's why we're disobedient. We don't think that this is going to turn out the way he say it is, so we become disobedient. Because all of a sudden, now we decide we're going to order our own footsteps. We become disobedient. Instead of just sticking with the plan that God has laid out. These people only had to walk around the building a few times. And you know what? In these directions that God gave, he didn't tell the people to pick up no spears, no axes. He didn't tell them that they was going to have to fight. He just said walk around the building once a, once a day for six days. How hard can that be? People say it's hard to be a Christian. No, it's not. Because the Bible says that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. So it's not hard, because he's already given us the tools to do it with. When I was little, when Thanksgiving came up, my grandmother would take that big bowl and start mixing up that cake. Uh-huh. But only one spoon could be in it doing it. One spoon. So when God is in it, you got to get out of it. When God is in it, you got to get out of it. You got to get out of his way and let him work. And oftentimes we, we think we got to help God. We think we got to help him alone as though he don't know what he's doing. But God don't need our help. He's directed us thus far in life. What makes you think now he needs your help? You're 40, 50, 60 years old. Now you think God needs your help? He didn't need it for all them years before. So the instructions were also given to try the people's faith, their obedience, and their patience. That's why he, he gave them these instructions. To try whether they would observe a precept which the human policy seemed foolish to obey and believe a promise which in human probability seemed impossible to be performed. God is a God of impossibility. The things that you can't do, he can do. The people said, you know, we just said, oh, man, we're going around this wall. I don't see how walking around this wall going to make it fall. That's what we just said. Because we, we're a little too wise today, you know. I, mean, I can't see walking around here six times. How is this going to make this wall fall? But the people had to be obedient. And that's why you can't take every time you are getting tested you cannot interpret it as a bad thing. God needs to see your obedience when things are favorable, but mostly when they're unfavorable. Because when things are unfavorable in your life, that's when you pray a little bit more. Let's be real here. When things is rosy, when you got money in the bank, you got a decent car, you got a good job, you know, worries are very few. We don't pray as much, but let something, some stumbling block come up. That's when we seem to pray more. And so it's easy being obedient when things are going good. But the real test is when they're not favorable, when you got to read bad report from the doctor or something. Obedient. Now, 
it's, it's, it's a struggle. Now it's a struggle. And so he had to test these people, try their faith. Do you believe I can do what I said I'm going to do? Do you believe if I tell you to walk around this building six times, it's going to fall? He was, he was testing their faith too. Their trust in him. Their trust in him. Because after all, look at all he had done for them up to that point. And for me, I'm like, these had to be some of the stupidest people on this earth. Because all that God had done for them, parting Red Seas, swallowing up their enemies, dropping food from heaven, bringing water out of a rock, and I've got to get here and say, I don't know if he got this right. Huh? All those things that God has done for you to bring you thus far in life, and this obstacle in front of you, you're going to start having a little doubt? Hmm? That's a sad commentary for a Christian. Because God's got a track record with you. He done fixed a lot of stuff for you that you couldn't fix yourself. Come on now. There's a lot of things you couldn't fix that he done fixed for you. Some of us have had some health issues, and he's fixed those. You couldn't fix them, but he could. So he, he has a track record. I don't understand these people. And so... Um, I want you to know that by faith and not by force, the walls of Jericho fell down. The strongest and the highest walls cannot hold out against God. They needed not to fight. They needed not to fear because God fought for them. God already had a victory for them. And so this morning, our time is up. This morning, if... If you're not a Christian and you need a victorious God in your life because you have some things that you got to overcome, you got some walls that you need to tear down, you can do that by hearing the word, believing the word, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ and being baptized. Then you become a child of God. Then God can start, to, Jesus can start to tear down some of the walls in your life. Up to this point, your walls have all been shaky and on bad foundation. This morning, I'm offering you to become a child of God so God can begin to tear down those walls and re-erect you. Thank you all this morning.